Good morning. Welcome to Midway. We're glad that you're here today. And uh, we're going to stand together and sing a song as we get started this morning. Hymn 44. If you're following along in the hymn book there, to God be the glory. Great things he hath done. Hymn 44. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Life and atonement for sin, and go in the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh God, to the Father. The Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done, great things he has taught us, great things he has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but no. forward to a good day at church this morning. Uh, let's pray together and we'll ask God's blessing as we get started here today. Brother Harold White, would you lead us in prayer, sir? Amen. Psalm 145 verse 1 says, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. And what we do today should be the catalyst of what happens the rest of this week as we look around and we see the beauty of God's creation, as we see the leaves change, as we see the, the, the leaves fall, we see all the beauty that God has put around us. We should praise the Lord for that. Sing the song with us, indescribable. Struck, we fall to 
hymn number 38 in your hymn book there, How Great Thou Art. Uh, we're going to continue to sing together here this morning. Hymn 38, How Great Thou Art.
this time. Uh, we are glad to have some kids here with us this morning. Looks like a good bunch today. We're glad every one of you guys are here. And we've got a special time for you upstairs with Children's Church. Um, if you guys uh, would be dismissed there. And uh, you can be working on some stuff. We're getting ready for Christmas uh, coming up here soon. That's going to be exciting. And uh, so we're getting ready for that coming up in just a, man, it'll be just a few weeks uh, once Christmas gets started up here. So uh, you guys can be dismissed upstairs. And uh, can I get some gentlemen to help me with the offering uh, today? If I could have some fellows help me pass the plates here today. We'll give our tithes and offerings uh, for this week. And uh, we will spend some time together here this morning uh, worshiping the Lord through the offering. Let's pray together. We'll ask God's blessing as we give here today. Brother Ian, would you lead us in prayer, sir?
Thank you, Brother Sager, for sharing that song with us this morning. And uh, this is the Sagers' um, last Sunday with us. Uh, they're going to be uh, getting some things prepared uh, for the move out to Washington. Uh, and so you be in much prayer for them as they uh, have a lot of work to do. And uh, praise the Lord for what God's doing in their lives as uh, he's taking that church out there. Um, and Moses Lake. I got it right that time, right? Okay, Moses Lake. So you be in uh, much prayer for them as they uh, serve the Lord out there and pray for uh, that ministry, pray for that church, and uh, praise the Lord for you guys and uh, what a blessing you've been to our church in such a short time. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, let's, let's be in prayer for those um, that we know that are going through difficult times, difficult seasons. You know, we had a great revival uh, meeting this past, uh, this past week, and uh, God did some really neat things. But you know what? When there's new levels, there's new devils. And as God grows us and builds us, the devil will go on the move. And so we need to be in prayer for one another. Um, we need to be in prayer for those that are lost, that we're trying to reach. We need to be in prayer for others that uh, the, the devil's attacking right now. And uh, let's be in prayer for each other um, as we fight this good fight together. Aren't you glad, though, that you don't have to fight it alone? Aren't you glad that we have one another as the church body, as believers in Jesus Christ. And ultimately, we have the Lord. We have the Lord's presence with us. We have uh, His strength, His Holy Spirit, His Word. Um, with all of that, boy, we have all that we need to keep fighting and pressing on. So uh, let's just continue to be in prayer for one another um, as we move forward from that. And let's be thinking about those things. Let's think about the truths that we uh, learned and the things that uh, Brother Flander shared with us. Uh, over that revival week. So uh, this morning, let's uh, begin our reading today in Exodus chapter 20. If you go there with me to Exodus chapter 20. We're going to read here verses 1 through 17. Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17. Exodus chapter 20, verse number 1. Exodus chapter 20, verse number 1, the Bible says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. 
Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord God made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And over the next few weeks, I want us to take some time as we close out 2019. It's hard to believe we're closing out 2019, isn't it? Uh, But we are in the home stretch uh, of this year. And as we begin to close out this year, I want us to think about one more set of simple truths that will help us develop, uh, develop a simple faith so that we can be a simple church. A church that is focused and driven. We know what we're about. And we are doing what God would have us to do. So I want us to work our way through this passage of Scripture in this, in these, what we call the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. Now, obviously, if you spent much time in the Bible, you understand that in the Old Testament there were more than ten commandments that were given, right? It's about 600 and some change uh, that God gave to the Old Testament Israelites. But what we're looking at here today and and over the next uh, 11 weeks is the Ten Commandments, uh, the, the, the Big Ten, the Big Ten as some people call them. And so to get us started today, I think we need to lay a little groundwork. Before we get into these commandments, before we start applying these things to our lives, we need to level the playing field, okay? We need to understand uh, what's going on here in this passage and what God's up to. So turn over to Joshua chapter 23, if you would. Joshua chapter 23, and let's look at a few verses here. And I want to share with you some thoughts about the Ten Commandments as we get started in this uh, journey together, okay? Joshua chapter 23, verse number 1. Joshua chapter 23 and verse number 1. The Bible says this, And it came to pass a long time after that the Lord had given rest unto Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua waxed old and stricken in age. All right, so we've moved pretty far into history here. We've moved kind of deeply into history here. Exodus chapter 20, uh, Moses is about to begin a 40-year journey with the children of Israel through uh, the the wilderness and 40 years of wilderness wandering. And then they're going to move. Moses will pass away, uh, go on to heaven. And then Joshua will become the new leader of the Israelites. Moses was more of a political, spiritual leader. um, But Joshua is more of a military leader. Um, And God puts Joshua in place so that they can move into the promised land, into Palestine, and begin their campaign against all of the, the, those heathen nations, the pagan nations there, and reclaim the promised land for the Israelites. And now, Joshua chapter 23, we're coming to the end of that campaign. We're coming to the end of that war, and the Israelites have claimed the territory. They've taken back their homeland, and now they are settling in. Things are starting to settle down a little bit, and... Joshua is going to say some things here. We're going to learn some things uh, that are going to guide the Israelites. Okay, verse number 2. Verse number 2, it says, And Joshua called for all Israel, and for their elders, and for their heads, and for their judges, and for their officers, and said unto them, I am old and stricken in age. By the way, that, that, that's a big admission on his part there, isn't it? Um, I, know, I don't know about you, but I know some old soldiers. I grew up in a military town. And I know some old soldiers, old army guys, old marines, some old rangers and things like that. And for them to say that they're old 
That's pretty. That's a pretty big deal. A lot of them are in their 50s and 60s, and if you put a rifle in their hand and said, go, they'd go. All right, they're ready to go at a moment's notice. But Joshua here, this old war dog, he realizes we're moving into a place of peace. We're moving into a place of victory. And so I, he, he confesses, my days of fighting are over. My days of battling are over. I am old and stricken in age. Verse number 3, and he says, And ye have seen all that the Lord your God hath done unto all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he that fought for you. Behold, I have divided unto you by lot these nations that remain to be an inheritance for your tribes from Jordan with all the nations that I have cut off even unto the great sea westward. And the Lord your God, he shall expel them from before you and drive them from out of your sight, and ye shall possess their land as the Lord your God hath promised unto you. So Joshua says, we fought the big fights. We fought Jericho. We fought Ai. We fought uh, the, 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 in the slime pits. Uh, he says, we fought all these major battles. Now, you tribal leaders, you go get your own militia together, and I'm going to tell you what your territory is going to be, and you're going to go out and you're going to go claim that land yourself. You're going to go finish this thing. We've got just a few skirmishes ahead of us from complete victory. Go out and do it. By the way, the end of the story is they didn't do it. Right? Joshua passes away, and they fail to complete the task. They fail to complete the mission and then we come to the book of Judges, but we're not in Judges today. Great study, something you should look into. Uh, but they did not finish the battle. They did not finish the work that God had called them to do and that Joshua had commanded them to do. But notice what he tells them there. He reminds them before he says anything, before he gives them any marching orders, he tells them something. He reminds them of a truth. What is it he tells them there at the end of verse number 3? For the Lord your God is he that fought for you. The Lord your God is he that fought for you. I know that there's probably somebody here today that you came here and you're, I told you we're going to talk about the Ten Commandments, but I just want to leave you with a thought. Maybe what you need to hear this morning is that God's going to fight for you. God's going to fight for you. Don't give up the fight. Don't give up the ship. Don't phone it in. God is ready to fight for you. Hold on. Hold on. Keep the battle up. Verse number four. I'm sorry, verse number six. Verse number six. He says, Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left, that ye come not among these nations, these that remain among you, neither make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them nor bow yourselves unto them, but cleave unto the Lord your God, as ye have done unto this day. Joshua says, things are about to slow down a little bit. Things are about to get into a little bit of a lull. And, but you still need to be very courageous. You need to be very courageous. But not with a sword in your hand, not with a shield in your hand, not in a chariot. You need to be courageous in your soul. You need to be courageous in your heart. Be very courageous to keep the law that Moses gave us. To keep the law of Moses. He says, it's going to take a lot of courage to do that. It's going to take a, a lot of stamina to do that. It's going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of energy to be able to be courageous enough to keep the law of Moses. Hmm. It's an interesting thought. It's an interesting thought. Do you realize that it's hard to be a Christian today? Do you realize that it's difficult to be a sold out 100% Christian in our world today? Hard to be a 100% sold out Christian in Unionville, Missouri. Imagine how how much diffi how difficult it is in other parts of this world to be a 100% sold out Christian to do what God has told us to do. It's tough. It's tough. We must be very courageous to do it. And so this morning, I want us to take a look at this at the big picture of the law of Moses. We need to ask this question. Whose law is it anyway? Whose law is it anyway? Is it Moses' law or is it God's law? Is it Moses' law or is it God's law? And how in the world is, does it apply to me today? It's difficult to be a sold-out Christian today. It's difficult to live according to the truths of Scripture today. But guess what? It was difficult in that day too. It wasn't easy in their day either. We think that everybody just sat around worshiping and singing about God all the time and everything was easy and there was no problems. We need to step back in history for a minute and realize that these ancient people were fighting for their lives day in and day out. 
They were trying to survive. If they didn't have some aggressor, some Hittite or Hivite or Jebusite or Mosquito Bite or something attacking them that day, if that was going well, they still had to find food to feed their family with for the day. They still had to find clean water and hope that nobody got sick with dysentery or some horrible thing that day. It was hard to live godly. It's hard to keep a right attitude, I imagine, in those circumstances. It was hard to love the Lord their God with all their heart and all their soul and all their might in that kind of environment, just like it's not real easy for us to do that sometimes. Just like we might, we might say, well, they had some excuses to not follow God, just like we try to have excuses for why we don't follow God. So the, the law of Moses, the, the law of God, helps us. It guides us. It gets us where we need to be. And it is just as important for us today as it was back then. Has, it changed, has, the, has the law changed its role in our lives? Somewhat. But it is still important for us today. So let's take a look at this together here this morning. But before we do that, why don't we pause and pray? We'll ask God to help us this morning. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for everybody that's gathered together in this building. And Lord, I pray for those who would be here or should be here but cannot be for one reason or another. God, I pray that you'd be with them. Uh, Lord God, help them this week, we pray. Help us now as we spend some time in your word, and we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to show you something. I want you to think about this. John chapter 14 and verse number 15. The Lord Jesus Christ says this. He says, If ye love me, give money to the church. Is that what you think it says? If you love me, win souls. Doesn't even say that, does it? If you love me, make sure you're at all the church services and all the revival services and all that. If you love me, then is that what it says? No. No, what does it say? If you love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. Jesus says that this is the test. This is the display of our true love for God our true love for Christ. If we love him like we say we love him, then we'll do what he says to do. We'll do what he says to do. So this law of Moses in Scripture that we're talking about here this morning, it's actually more than just these Ten Commandments, as I've already said. 600 and some odd uh, laws that the Old Testament believers, the Old Testament Israelites were expected to keep. Um, But we we could say that the first five books of the Bible... That's the law. That's what the Israelites, if you talk to a Jew today and say, what is the law? They're going to tell you the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the law of Moses, so to speak. But there's more information. There's more instruction throughout the Old Testament where God makes commandments of his people. And so what do I do with that? What do I do with that? As a New Testament believer, as somebody in 2019, after Jesus has died on the cross and resurrected and back in heaven, what do I do with those 600 commandments? Am I required to keep those? Does that have anything to do with my hope of heaven? What should I be teaching my children to do? What about those passages of Scripture where it says that you shouldn't eat shellfish? Do we need to pay attention to those things? Do we need to hang on to those truths? Uh, what do we do with all this? I hope this morning that we'll be able to clear some of that up, that I'll be able to clarify some things uh, that will help us all understand this law that God has given to us before we get into these big ten truths, these big ten commands that we call the Ten Commandments. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about the division of the law. The division of the law. If you're in my Sunday school class over there in the gym, you've heard me talk about this a little bit, but don't dial out yet, okay? Don't don't phone in yet. Uh, We're going to hopefully give you some help here this morning. But generally speaking, we can divide the Old Testament law up into three divisions, three areas uh, of uh, where God is dealing with a specific aspect of people's lives, where God's dealing with a specific part of people's lives, okay? So first of all, let's talk about the moral code, the moral code, okay? The the moral code of God's law are the parts that you find mainly in the book of Deuteronomy and the Ten Commandments, all right? Uh, We we find uh, these truths of morality, what what is right and what is wrong. As a parent, My biggest and hardest job is to teach my children the difference between right and wrong. 
Because we live in a world today that wants to tell us to be selfish. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. It's all about what I'm after. And we're bent that way anyways, aren't we? We're kind of, the, the trees sort of turn that direction already. And so as a parent, we have to kind of train that tree to change directions and go the other way. That's not easy to do. It's not easy to do. We live in a world today that says if it feels good, then it must be right. Go ahead and do it. But we have a God, we have a, a word here that says just because it feels right doesn't mean anything. Just because it feels good doesn't mean anything. Sometimes what God says is right doesn't feel good at all. So what do we do with that? What do we do with that? We need to understand that there is a moral code here. We're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go through this. Let's talk secondly about the civil code. The civil code, okay? Okay. When God gave the book of Leviticus and the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy and things like that, he was speaking to a specific people at a specific point in human history, right? I want us to read the Bible. When we read the Bible, I want us to read it as if God were speaking to us. But we need to understand that God did not say these things directly to us. God wrote these things for us, for our benefit, but he wrote these things and said these things to other people. So when he's speaking to the nation of Israel, he's giving them a law. Um, how many of you have ever read the Constitution of the United States of America and the, the Ten Amendments? Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the 20, are we at 27 now? All the amendments section. Anybody ever read all of that before? Read all that before? My goodness. My goodness. Next Sunday, that's what we're going to do. We're going to sit down. We're going to read the Constitution together. We need to know what we're being governed by here, folks. All right? But that is a civil code. That is civil law. It does not tell us what is right and what is wrong. That civil code, the Constitution tells us what this country is going to be busy doing, how our governance is going to work. In Missouri, we have our own Constitution here. Iowa has its own state Constitution. To be honest, never read those. Do not plan on doing that. But And then underneath that, we have uh, civil codes and statutes and ordinances uh, statewide. And then local, we've got different codes and all kinds of things. And who can keep up with all of it, right? But all those things are telling us how we're going to behave as citizens, right? How the government's going to treat us and how we're going to treat each other as fellow man. Okay, that's the civil code of the Old Testament. So in the, in the civil code is where we find things like God telling uh, the, the Israelites, if you have a rebellious son who won't listen and he won't uh, obey and he's just pushing back against you, bring him to the temple. And we're going to stone that boy. The civil code, all right? That's a part of the civil code. Now, why is that important? Because that was written to a specific people at a specific point in human history, right? Let me ask you something. Do we live in the nation of Israel today? No. And by the way, the, Israel, or the, the Jews who are living in what we call the nation of Israel today are not living in the same nation that Moses set up and that God set up in the Old Testament. When you step outside of Old Testament Israel, the civil parts of the law of God cease to be of any effect. They cease to be of any effect. They do not, uh, they're not demanded or commanded of us. Now, is there some wisdom in them? Absolutely. Are there some things that we can learn? Absolutely. Now, if you have a rebellious child and he's not listening, you have a son and he's you know, 16, 17, 18 years old and he's just running amok, if you bring him to church we will not throw rocks at him, okay? We're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We're not going to stone him. But it might be a good idea to say, I need help. I need help with this. What I'm doing is not working. I need some help. And go get a preacher. Go get a counselor. Go get some people that you can bring in and say, we've got to do something about this. We're at a stopping point. We can't go any further like this. This boy is going to wreck himself, and he's going to wreck our family if we keep going this way. So there's some wisdom that we can glean from the Old Testament civil code, but we're not going to live under force of that any longer. And I can prove this to you. I can prove to you that God does not enforce it anymore. Read the book of Daniel sometime. Daniel was, what, was from what country, what nation? I, I want you to answer this one, okay? What nation was he from? 
originally? Where was he born? What was his citizenship? Daniel. Israel, thank you. All right, Israel. I know it's tough when, when you're here in this room with all these people. It's hard to, you don't want to be wrong. I get it, okay? Um, but Daniel was an Israelite, meaning that his family was under the civil code that says, stone that guy, stone that guy, stone that person, right? Okay. And by the way, it's not the only thing it says, but for some reason we get hung up on all that stuff. Daniel goes to this country of Babylon. In fact, he's kidnapped, right? He's kidnapped out of his own country along with a lot of other young people, and they're taken captive to Babylon, and they're there, and they're being trained and taught how to be Babylonians. We don't want you to be Jews anymore. We want you to be Babylonians. But Daniel says, wait a minute, wait a minute. In my own heart, I know that God has told me to do some things. He's told me his law. And I, even though I'm here in Babylon, I still want to live like a Jew. And so there are some things he said, I'm just not going to do, right? He purposed in his heart, Daniel 1, verse number 8, I think it is, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meats. He said, we have a different dietary code than you guys do. Would it be okay if we just live that way? All right? But then in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, the, the emperor, the king, has a dream. He has a dream. And he calls together all of his wise men, all of his counselors, magicians, and he says, I had a dream last night. You know, doggone it, I can't remember what it was. But it, I think it was really important. I think it was a big deal. You ever have one of those dreams where you wake up and you're like, that was a very vivid thing, but I can't remember a thing about it. I feel like I need to remember that, but I just can't. That's what happened to him. And he has this dream, and he wakes up the next day, and he says, I need you guys to tell me the interpretation of the dream. And they said, well, well King, could you give us any details here to start with. We could help you interpret it if we had any details whatsoever. I got nothing, guys. I got nothing. You're on your own. You're going to have to figure this out. Well, were you near water or were you eating something? I, I don't know. I've got no clue, guys. I don't remember anything about it. They said, King, we can't do that. We can't tell you the interpretation of a dream that you don't even know. And Nebuchadnezzar caught him. He caught him in that moment, and he looked down, and he said, you guys are supposed to be magicians. You're supposed to be uh, artificers of the crafts of magic. You ought to be able to tell me what I dreamed and the interpretation of it. And I believe this so much that if you don't tell me the interpretation of it, and I think it was seven days, you're all going to die. Whoa. Whoa. Well, that seems like a pretty desperate thing, doesn't it? That sounds like you go home and you say, Honey, I quit my job today. You wouldn't believe it, but it just got a little stressful. I quit my job, and I think we're just going to go move down to Assyria, and I'm going to put in some applications down there like tonight. Can we go? Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they all get together and they start to pray because they're one of these. They're, they're in this group of wise men. And they start to pray together, and they say, God... You reveal the hidden things. God, you're a revealer of secrets. God, would you tell us what's in this dream? And you, wouldn't you know it? God did. God told him exactly what the dream was and exactly what the interpretation was, what it meant for Nebuchadnezzar, what it meant for the nation, because God used dreams at that point. And they go back to Nebuchadnezzar, and they say, King, King, us little Jews that you wanted to turn into Babylonians, we know what your dream's all about. We can tell you the, the purpose of your dream. We can tell you what's behind it. And Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, go ahead and tell me. And he, he says, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. But first, promise me that you won't hurt these other men. Promise me that you won't, that you won't kill these prophets. Go ahead and fire them because they're obviously not very good at what they do. But don't kill them. Don't kill them. If Daniel had been living in Israel, he would have been asking Nebuchadnezzar to break the law of God. Because the law of God demanded that if a, if a prophet is found to be a false prophet, what was supposed to happen to him? Stone him that he may die. Kill him. Put him to death. So if Daniel were living in Israel, he should have been the first one to pick up a rock and start throwing it at those false prophets. But Daniel said, no, 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 spare their lives, king. Spare their lives. Why? Because he's not living in Israel anymore. These people, these false prophets, as false as they were, 
They were not under the judgment of the civil code of Israel. Okay? One more, the ceremonial code. The ceremonial code. In the Old Testament, there were all kinds of things that were happening, and the book of Leviticus tells us how they were supposed to happen. People would come, and they would bring their tithes and offerings uh, to the temple. People would come, and they'd bring a, a spotless lamb, and that lamb would be sacrificed for sins, and there were peace offerings and meal offerings and all kinds of different offerings that were being made. And one day out of the year would come the Day of Atonement, and two goats would be brought to the, 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 the tabernacle, to the temple, and the priest would kill one of the goats, and he would take the blood from killing that goat, and he would put his hands upon the head of that other goat, signifying the, the shedding of blood covering the sins of the people by putting his hands, his bloody hands, on that goat. And then a man would take that goat out into the wilderness and leave it there. And that's where we get the term scapegoat, because the people were trusting in, the, in that promise that God would not allow uh, their sins to continue forever, but he would make a way for sin to be covered, for sin to be forgiven and atoned for. And then we come to the New Testament, and we hear about a man who is falsely put on trial. He is accused of crimes he never committed, and he is sent to Pontius Pilate. And Pilate says, I find no fault in him. This is a perfect offering. This is a sinless and spotless goat. Why would we kill that? And the Jews say, crucify him. Crucify him. And they drag him and beat him. And then they bring him back and they say, crucify him. And they drag him to a place called Golgotha or Calvary. And they nail him to a cross and they put him there and allow him to hang and, and undergo the most severe torture you can imagine. And he is hanging there suspended between earth and heaven and he dies. And then three days later he rises from the dead. And the Apostle Paul in the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 2, I believe it is, he tells us that all of those things in the Old Testament, the sacrifice system, the peace offerings, the day of atonement, that goat, and the, the two goats, and the scapegoat, and all of that, it all was preparing us. It was preparing the Israelites for the day when Christ would die. It was preparing everyone for Jesus to come. He says there that it's those things, all those old elements, the Sabbaths and the holy days and all those things, they are a shadow of things to come. They are not the end in and of themselves. They're getting us ready so that we'll see, the, see Christ for who he is, that we'll see Jesus for who he is, that he is our scapegoat. That he is the one who took our sins upon himself. And with the covering of his blood, we can have forgiveness, we can have salvation, we can have hope in heaven. And all of that was a part of the ceremonial code of the nation of Israel. And the Apostle Paul says in Colossians, don't let anybody judge you, therefore, if you don't keep the holy days, if you don't keep the Sabbaths. Don't go back and start sacrificing goats and lambs and things like that and turtle doves anymore. All of that was finished and completed when Jesus died on the cross. He is the final sacrifice to satisfy the ceremonial code of the law. So what does all that have to do with anything? Well, I don't know about you, but if you, if you have a conversation with an atheist or you have a conversation with anybody who's an unbeliever that knows anything about the Bible, one of the first things that they're going to take you to is, well, what about all those places in the Bible where God says to kill your children? I'm sorry, that, that doesn't apply. It doesn't even apply. You see, God made that command to a specific people at a specific point in human history, and by the way, they asked him to do it. They said, God, whatever you tell us to do, we'll do. We're going to obey you. Whatever you say to do, we're going to do it. They, they gave God the contract. They signed their names at the bottom, and they handed God the contract and said, you just fill in the rest. And God did. But God isn't holding you to that civil part of the code. God isn't holding you to the ceremonial code. I was telling my class this morning that we're not going to bring in, I know it's International Lunch Sunday, but we're not going to bring in any goats and bring them down front and kill them and barbecue them, okay? 
It's not what we're doing here today. If you're going to do that, go do it in the back. Don't do it up here, all right? We don't, we don't do that anymore. We don't make sacrifices anymore. Why? The ceremonial code's been done away with. So when somebody throws that at you, I just want you to be informed that the law of Moses, uh, it's different for the New Testament believer. But there's one area that we do need to talk about just briefly here. Okay, we do need to talk about the moral code. We do need to talk about the moral part. Has the, so, so we no longer offer sacrifices. We no longer um, are stoning people in the streets at the church house. We're not doing that stuff anymore. So do we not keep idols out of our house anymore? Do we still honor the name of the Lord? Do we still no longer lie? Do we protect our lives from stealing from other people? I mean, do those things still sit in force? Are those things still required for the believer in today's world? Okay? So we're going to talk about this here for just a, a few minutes here, but I want to show you a couple things. First of all, the delivery of the law. The delivery of the law. Why did God even bother writing these things down? Why did God even bother delivering this to this young nation? Why did God take his time and energy to do this? And why did he give us these Ten Commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 20? What was the point of all of that? Well, let me give you a few thoughts on that. First of all, each one of these Ten Commandments that we're talking about in Exodus chapter 20, they reflect God's character. They reflect God's character. Why does it matter the way that we live? Why does God care what we do with our lives? Because of what he told Old Testament Israel and what he tells the New Testament church. Be ye holy, for I am holy. You as a believer, you as a Christian, we are called to reflect God to the world around us. We are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And so we are to reflect God in our lives. So God says, I'm holy, you be holy as well. And each one of these Ten Commandments reflect a piece of God's character. We are not to do these things. We are told by God to not do these things because God's character makes him incapable of doing these things. Why should we not lie? Because God always tells the truth. And so if we're going to reflect God's character and God's nature, then we should be people of truth as well. Why uh, should we not have false gods? Why should we not worship other things in life? And by the way, I'm excited to get to that one next week. Because that verse means something a little bit different than I think we think it means sometimes. But why does God tell us not to worship these false gods? Because there's one God. And when we start uh, relying on and placing value upon things that don't deserve to have our hearts, we are saying that I have more than one God. God's not good enough. I need something bigger than God. Why does uh, God tell us, uh, not to kill. And by the way, that means don't murder, right? Why, why, should, why is God so uh, big on that? Because God is always just. God is always right. I'm thankful that I don't have to decide who's getting into heaven or who's going to hell. I'm glad that God set those terms himself. I'm glad that God figured all of that out already because he is just and we are not. Each one of these things reflect a part of God's character, and we'll dig into that a little bit deeper as we go through. But number two, they are eternal rules. They are eternal rules that are founded on and are themselves truth. Truth. When God says, don't lie, don't bear false witness, he says that because the world and the universe that we live, live in are built on truth. Does 2 plus 2 equals 4 or not? Does that ever change? Does that ever adjust? Is there some days when 2 plus 2 equals 5? Are there some days when 2 plus 2 equals 20,000? No. It's always the same. And the world, the universe that we're living in is built on simple truths and simple math, a lot of it, 
is built upon that structure. One man wisely said that God, uh, that math was the yardstick by which God measured the heavens and created the heavens. And there's a lot of truth to that. So these things that we're looking at here, God wants us to tell the truth because all around us the world functions according to truth. You ever notice that things just go better when you tell the truth? You ever notice that life just happens to work out better when you're a person of truth? You know why? Because the world is built on truth. Now, we've, we live in a world today and in a society today that tells us, yeah, you can fudge a little bit there. You can get ahead if you just smudge the lines there a little bit. And you Be, be honest with that person. That guy over there, he doesn't deserve it. You can tell him whatever you want to tell him. You know what? You're, that, don't, don't swallow that lie. Don't swallow that lie. The world that we live in is built on truth. When God says don't steal and he says don't covet, he says that. Because you and I have some basic fundamental rights that God has given to us. And one of those things is to be safe and for our possessions to stay with us. Right? So these are eternal truths. These are unchanging truths. These are things that don't adjust. And the only one that we're we're going to talk about it when we get to it, but the only one that maybe we could uh, talk a little bit deeper is the Sabbath day. But we'll talk about that a little bit more once we get there. All right, number three, they are guides for the believers. They are guides for the believers. Can I say this? We talked about this extensively in Sunday school, but I want to just give kind of a a high-level picture of this this morning, okay? They are guides for the believer. I said that with much intent. They are not guides for the unbeliever. Now, if we live in a world today where people would just do the Ten Commandments, if we would just live by those dictates, by those rules, the world would be a better place, wouldn't it? It would be. But God didn't give the Ten Commandments uh, so that the unbeliever would know how to live. Galatians tells us that God gave the Ten Commandments and the rest of the Law of Moses, the rest of the commands, so that the unbeliever would see that he's a sinner. It's not so that he can say, I did a good job today. I kept nine of the Ten Commandments today, or this was a great day. I kept ten of the Ten Commandments. Pat myself on the back. You know, a lot of times when we pat ourselves on the back, we wind up breaking our shoulder. You ever notice that? God did not give us the Ten Commandments so that unbelievers can say, I'm good. You remember that man that came to Jesus and he said, I've kept all the Ten Commandments from my birth. Can I be your follower? And Jesus said, Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and then we'll talk. And then we'll talk. You know what Jesus knew about that guy that nobody else knew? You kept him, but your heart's not in it. You kept him, but your heart's not in the right place. You see, the Ten Commandments, are uh, they, they, they do not guide the unbeliever. They condemn the unbeliever. They condemn mankind. They show us that you and I are not good enough and will never be good enough to make our way through this life, much less make our way into heaven. We are sinners in need of a Savior. And so Paul says in Galatians that the law of God is a schoolmaster. It's a schoolmaster to teach us the truth, to teach us that I'm not good enough. I don't care what the television tells us. We are not good enough. I don't care what popular society wants to say. Mankind is born in sin, and we are plunged into darkness because of it. And by the way, when you read the headlines and you look at the newspaper, we're not acting like a society that's walking in light. We're acting like a society that's walking in darkness. How many of you had a teacher in school that it got a little hard on you sometimes? Anybody have a teacher that broke out the ruler? You know what I'm talking about? They'd walk down the the aisles while you're testing or working on homework, and if you weren't doing what you were supposed to be doing, what would they do with that ruler? Smack! Right on the hand. Some of you were really unlucky, and they got you on the head, and it shows. Just kidding. Just kidding. But I had a teacher like that, one teacher. And by the way, I'm sure it's written in the teacher handbook not to do that anymore because even then it wasn't real popular. But I had one teacher do it to me one time, and I didn't do that again. 
my, the school that I went to, um, the Christian school I went to, allowed paddling if the parents were okay with it. And so my parents were. <laughs> and so I got some paddlings at school. And you know what I did? Stop doing the things I wasn't supposed to do anymore. For a little while, right? For a little while. Until they weren't looking at me. And then I, I went ahead and did what I did. But you know what that was? That was a schoolmaster. A little smack on the hand. Hey, hey, get it together. Hey, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing right now. That's what the law does. It's a schoolmaster to smack us on the hand and say, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing right now. You know, you ever have, I just have this picture in my head of a teacher who's just, oh, maybe a little elderly and she's got her hair pulled tightly back in a bun and just it's, sm it's pulled so hard her face is just she looks angry all the time. You, you have a teacher like that growing up, but boy, I did. And I just have that picture of her scorning and not scorning, but scolding. That's the word I'm looking for. Scolding and now you're not supposed to do that. Nom, 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 nom. Just on you all the time. Leave me alone. By the way, looking back on that, those were some of my favorite teachers. Looking back on them, those are the ones that come to mind when I remember school, by the way. Praise God for strict teachers. But here's the, here's the truth. Here's what Paul wanted us to learn out of Galatians. For the unbeliever, the law condemns. It points out our flaws. It points out our sins. But thank the Lord, we don't have to stay there. It's not the end of the story. Then comes the gospel. On the heels of the condemning, cursing law comes the gospel. One of the things that I want to make sure that I do as a parent and that I instruct other parents to do is when we're disciplining our children, whatever that looks like in that moment, that when we're correcting, we're serious about it. We're not playing games. Hey, listen. We need to be serious about it, otherwise they won't take it seriously, right? But then once the seriousness is over, once the discipline has come, let the love flow. Let the love come out. Not to discipline in anger. Because by the way, what is the difference between disciplining and anger and child abuse? Not a lot, is there? To discipline in anger. But once the discipline is over, once the correction has been established, to be there to comfort and love and help that child. That's the way God treats us. And so I just think that's the way we ought to treat our kids. It's the way God handles it with us. He brings the law to us and he says, Hey, wake up. You're not doing right. You're making a mess. But man, I love you to death. I'd do anything to see you get on the right path. In fact, I'd do so much that I'd send my own son to die for you so that your sins might be forgiven. For the unbeliever, they condemn. For the believer, it guides it guides. Now that we know Christ, now that Christ is our Savior, now that we've actuated that love, it's become real in our lives, now I get to do the law. I get to do right. Before, before we trusted Christ, it was, you have to, you have to, you have to, you have to. Now it's, I get to to serve the Lord. I get to live for God. I get to love. I get to serve. I get to do all these things. It's, it's a joy to me now. It's a blessing because now my heart has been changed. I remember as a kid getting disciplined as a, as a kid and I didn't get enough spankings. I'll just be honest with you and it shows. Um, I should have gotten more than I, I did probably. But my dad just had a way. He just knew how to discipline me. He just knew how to get a hold of me. He, he just had this look in his eye. I mean, how many of you guys have the dad look? You know, the, the look where you, the, when the kids look at you, they, ooh, he's, he's for real. And he had the voice. He had the voice. Now I hear him talking, it doesn't, it doesn't faze me. But when I was a kid, boy, he just had a certain timber to his voice that would just get a hold of me. Ryan? Yes, sir. He just had a way of disciplining me. And then... As I grew and developed and I got through my rebellious phase, I started doing the things my dad wanted me to do all along. Not because I was forced to. Not because I was afraid of the voice. But because I love my dad. 
I want to please him. I want to honor him. Man, he's been great to me. He's taken care of me all this time. He's been there for me. He's given me wisdom. Sure, he's not perfect, but he's pretty good. He's pretty good. He's my dad. And now I'm going to do what he says to do, not because I have to, but because I want to. I want to. Well, what are the things that we should do to honor our Father in heaven? What are the good deeds that we should do to to live for God in this present age? The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, they are guides for the believer. Let me say just another thing here, and we'll close up here this morning. But we need to think about this. Have you ever considered that Jesus Christ is the only person who has kept the Ten Commandments perfectly? The only person in human history who's been able to do that. And that is what God is trying to build into us. Through the fruit of the Spirit, through the filling of the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, God is trying to teach us and train us, to nurture and admonish us to live out these things in our lives just as Jesus did. And they're so simple. Boy, they're simple, aren't they? Thou shalt not kill. Pretty straightforward. Don't steal. Okay. All right. Don't need a lot of conversation about that. Don't need a lot of instruction about that. Will Rogers said this. He said, the minute a thing is long and complicated, it confuses. When Moses wrote the Ten Commandments, he made them short. They may not always be kept, but they are understood. They are understood. God has given us a pretty clear, uh, a pretty clear instruction about how we ought to live, and we can start with these important Ten Commandments. By the way, we'll, I'll say this and we'll be done. They lead us to perform the opposite of the action they condemn. They lead us to perform the opposite of the action they condemn. Think about this for a minute. When God said, thou shalt not steal, stealing is wrong, don't do it. What's the opposite of stealing? Not stealing, right? Don't take things that don't belong to you. When he said, don't commit adultery, what's the opposite of adultery? Faithfulness. Don't kill. What's the opposite of murder? Leaving people alone. Keeping your hands off of people. Keeping your aggression off of people. The, see, God made this so simple, and God is so smart, isn't he? He's got this thing figured out. He's shown us exactly what we need to be doing in our lives, and he can do it in just a few words. Hey, don't do this. And if you don't do this, guess what? You're going to do the things I want you to do. If you you don't murder, if you don't steal, if you don't kill, if you don't do all these things, guess what? You're going to be doing the things I want you to do anyways. And God is wise. God is smart. He's got this thing figured out. And here's what I want us to understand as we get ready to launch into these piece by piece and how they apply to us. Each one of these things guide us because they each cover a whole multitude of sins. Did you know there's more than one way to commit adultery? There's more than one way to kill. Whoa. We, we need to figure this thing out, don't we? We've got to get this thing figured out so that we can live according to the plan that God has for your life. Don't use the law of God to run from God. Don't use the law of God to run from God. There are a lot of people doing that. Well, I'm a good person. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing in life. I'm not doing anything all that bad, you know. I've never robbed a bank. I've never killed anybody. I don't, I don't steal. I don't lie. I'm keeping most of the Ten Commandments. I'm a pretty good person. You're using God's law to run away from God when you do that. Don't do that. Come to the place where you realize, God, I am a sinner. I am in need of help. I am in need of a Savior. Let the law of God have its proper place in our lives. Can we pray together? God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your wisdom as we've worked through this passage of Scripture together. And as we've talked through these ideas, God, a lot of big stuff we're covering this week. But God, each one of these things that we've talked about today will help us as we move week by week through these important truths. God, I want to live a life that honors you. I want to live a life that shows others. I want to be like Jesus. So Lord, would you put it within our hearts to do that? 
God, what a lie, what a counterfeit we would be to keep these truths, to live out these truths, but not have the right heart behind it, to have selfish motives behind it. God, would you break our hearts today? Make us like the Lord Jesus Christ. Make us like him. May that be our desire so that when we get to heaven someday, we'll hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. But it won't be about us. It'll be about the fact that we followed Christ. We live for him. We did what he said to do. God, we need your help in a big way. God, I pray for the lives that are here today. Would you help us now in this time of invitation? In Jesus' name we pray. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed here today. If you're here and you say, Pastor Brian, I know that I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven, and I can tell you why from the Bible. If that's you this morning, you know that you've been born again by God's Spirit. If that's you, and you can show me from the Bible, would you slip your hand up there as a testimony of praise this morning? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Brian, I, I've been just trying to get by with this thing. You see, I thought that if I believed in some things and did all the right things, then that would be good enough for God. Maybe God's spoken to you about that today and you say, I realize I've been, I've been using God's law wrong. I've not been trusting in Christ. I've been kind of trusting in me and in my goodness and my performance. If that's you this morning, can I tell you this? You need Christ. You need Christ. Would you come forward and let's talk about that. Let me pray with you. Let's find some help for you today. Stop trusting in yourself and start trusting in the one who loved you and died for you, in him only. Maybe you're here today. You say, Pastor Brian, I know I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven, but God's speaking to me. God's dealing with me. Maybe something we talked about this morning, maybe something completely different, but you say, Pastor Brian, pray for me. If that's you today, would you just slip your hand up there so I can pray for you? Anybody like that? Amen. Amen. Hands around the room. The piano is going to play, and I'd like us just to sit and think there in our seats. Give God some quiet time to talk to our hearts this morning. And as the piano plays this hymn of invitation, if God has spoken to your heart, why don't you come forward? Why don't you come forward and find a place to bow before the Lord and talk to God? Just bend the knee to Him today. Surrender to Him. If you need somebody to speak with you, if you need somebody to pray with you, I'll be right down front. If you need help this morning, be glad to do that for you. But as the piano plays, if God has spoken to your heart, would you come? Lord, we don't live under the law. We live under grace. Lord, I'm so thankful for that. We are saved by grace through faith. But Lord, you told us in your word in Jeremiah 31 that when the Holy Spirit would come, that you would write your law in our inward parts. You would write the law on our hearts. And Lord, now the, the, the believer, the Christian, does not live to get favor from God so that we can go to heaven, have our sins forgiven, something like that, as so many do, uh, or try to do. But God, we live under your love. We live under your grace. And because of that, we have the privilege of honoring you with our lives. We have the privilege of living for you. God, it is a blessing 
and our world around us needs to see it so desperately. Unionville, Missouri needs to see Christians who are doing what God says to do, no compromise, no backing down, people who are committed to the truth of God, people who are committed to living for Christ above all else. God, raise up a generation like that, would you? And start with us. Start with us here in this room. Lord, we spent a whole uh, several days talking about revival. God, that is revival. Would you bring us to that place? God, would you help us now? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to take just a minute here and share with you some upcoming things today. Don't forget, we got international lunch today over in the gym. If you brought something, a little bit of an international flair, thank you for that. If you brought something else entirely, thank you for that. We appreciate you being a part of that. Please stay and join us uh, for that. Um, and then this Wednesday night, um, we're going to have a little fun at True Trackers, uh, dress-up night for the kids. Um, adults, I, I guess you can do it if you would like. Um, but uh, let's keep it. Let's keep it clear, okay? Let's keep it Christ-like. All right. Nothing scary. Nothing gory. Nothing occultic, uh, satanic, anything like that. Uh, let's keep it on the up and up. And the kids will have a good time um, uh, that, that night as we just have a little bit of fun with that. Uh, we've also got our quarterly business meeting this Wednesday. Uh, so looking forward to that. Uh, going over some uh, business from last quarter. If you're a member, I hope you'll be here. Um, and then uh, don't forget about. Um, Time change next weekend. Um, any birthdays to recognize today? Birthdays. Oh, Inez. All right. Wednesday, happy birthday. Anything else? Anyone, anyone else? How about anniversaries? Any anniversaries recognized today? All right, then. Well, Inez, why don't you... Uh, stop by the Resource Center and get something on behalf of the church. Appreciate that. Now, before we go this morning, I just want to put something in your mind to help you remember uh, what's coming up next weekend. And I want to show you a video of a guy who feels a lot like I feel about daylight savings. doing putting daylight saving time in its place in, a, in a vat of acid yeah still an hour for me last spring and it's not i repeat not getting another one you know you get that hour back right or you just you say clocks back in the fall and get that hour back but i destroyed all the clocks how am I supposed to get that hour back? How? Don't get to uh, set your clocks back. So you can um, get, get the hour back. Give me your watch. No. 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 All right, you've been warned. You get your hour back, all right? Let's stand together and we'll be dismissing a word of prayer. Thank you so much for being here today. And uh, don't forget, we've got our lunch, and then uh, we'll be back in here about 1 o'clock uh, for our afternoon uh, prayer meeting time together. Uh, but let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Brother Marty Brundage, would you lead us in prayer, sir?